Hey guys, I am so excited to announce that the movie that you've been waiting for, the documentary Dr. Patient, is now available for rent or purchase at drpatientmovie.com. Check out the trailer here. When I really knew something was wrong was when I started having trouble walking up the stairs. I was supposed to be grateful and happy and healing and well and thriving, but I did not feel that way. I was so sick. Like always, I wanted to find an answer and I had to figure it out, and I had to figure it out to save my own life. So I dove in. Jill is the leading voice in biotoxin illness and chronic conditions that are driven by toxicity. Oh my gosh, you're dealing with mold? You have to work with Dr. Jill Carnahan. Dr. Jill was the first person that actually began to shed some light on the problem. What I do is listen to the patient and we together talk about what else is possible. I don't know why I'm crying. <laughs> she saved my life. The deepest lessons and most profound insights come in the suffering, come in the dark moments. Self-compassion is the healing transition that, that shifts something inside of us. It's actually the thing that we need most in order to heal. Dr. Patient. Available now at drpatientmovie.com. Welcome to Resiliency Radio, your go-to podcast for the most cutting-edge insights in functional and integrative medicine. I'm Dr. Jill, your host, and with each episode, we delve deep into the heart of healing and personal transformation. Join us as we connect with renowned experts, thought leaders, and innovators who are at the forefront of medical research and practice, empowering you with knowledge and inspiration on your journey to optimal health. Today, I have one of my favorite people in the world, Dr. Neil Nathan, a friend and colleague. And we so often talk about how we um, think a little differently than a lot of our conventional colleagues. But one of the things we're going to talk about today is how to really deal with a sensitive patient and how our intuition and the energetics of the healing process play into optimal um, outcomes. But before I do that, I want to introduce Dr. Neil Nathan. He's been practicing medicine for 48 years and has been board certified in family medicine and pain management. He's a founding diplomat of the American Board of Integrative Holistic Medicine and founding diplomat of ICI, that's Integrative Society for Environmentally Acquired Illness. He has written several books, including Healing is Possible, New Hope for Chronic Fatigue, Fibromyalgia, Persistent Pain, and Other Chronic Illnesses, on Hope and Healing, for those who have fallen through the medical cracks, he's hosted an internationally syndicated radio program on Voice America called The Cutting Edge of Health and Wellness Today, and he's been working to bring awareness that mold toxicity is a major contributing factor for both patients with chronic illness, and he lectures around the world. He's also written several books, and today we're going to talk about his very latest book called, Is It Healing the Sensitive Patient, Dr. Nathan? Uh, the Sensitive Patient's Healing Guide. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The sensitive. Okay. There it is. It actually exists. Yes. <laughs> the sensitive patient's healing guide. Um, and by the time this podcast airs, you should be able to order it on Amazon or um, in ebook form or in book form. Perfect. And wherever you're listening, there will be links to to the, uh, the where you can find this, to Dr. Neil Nathan's website, the Amazon links for the book. So um, we're going to be talking about that today. But before we dive in, Dr. Nathan, you have just an amazing history and you've been a leader in our world of integrative functional medicine, and especially in my favorite topic, which is environmental toxicity and mold-related illness. Tell us a little bit about your journey um, to, into medicine and then into this more specific world of a holistic lens of medicine. How much time do you have? <laughs> as much as you want. <laughs> okay, I'll give you the the um, shorter version. All right. When I when I went to medical school, I wanted to be a healer, and I thought that that's what I would learn about when I went to medical school. And one of my greatest earliest disappointments was no, that wasn't on the curriculum. I was going to learn how to be a medical technician, and that's fine but that's not what I was looking for. So when I left medical school, that's when my real education began. And I began studying with anyone who had even an idea of what healing was about. And so I studied a wide array of healing arts, if you will. I mean, I, I studied, and I, 
I was fortunate enough, I studied with some of the best in the world um, and had a phenomenal education. And I slowly evolved my own understanding of what healing was about. Um, so I started out as a family physician, delivered babies, did some surgery, worked in the ER, did the full gamut of what doctors do. But I was always drawn to those patients who my colleagues didn't know what to do with, the outliers. I mean, I, I love puzzles. I love working through complexity, which makes me probably a very strange man, but and I'll, I'll own that. So I tried and began to apply these new tools that I had to helping these patients. And I found that a lot of these tools were effective when conventional medicine didn't quite cut it. Um, that's not to say that conventional medicine isn't fabulous as far as it goes, but it is limited in its consciousness amongst other things. It kind of encourages a simplistic thinking, like one cause, one treatment. And we've learned over the last 25 years that bodies are really complicated. There is rarely one cause about why someone feels the way they do. And so this was the beginning of understanding, if you will, complexity. And part of my travels were I became a director of a regional pain clinic. Um, part of the things I learned was I studied osteopathic manipulation, I studied acupuncture, I studied just a wide array of tools that would help people with pain. And then I began to see this weird condition called fibrositis, which we now call fibromyalgia back in the mid 80s. It's this kind of weird condition where people were systemically ill, but it didn't fit any models that we had. And at that time, almost all those patients were being referred to psychiatrists for therapy or drugs, and it didn't work. And so slowly, we began to understand fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue as caused by a wide array of medical uh, nutritional imbalances in the body. And as that evolved, then we got into Lyme and mold. And, and here we are, um, you and I both dealing with this kind of complexity. Yeah, I think we share that de the desire for uh, mystery, the curiosity. And you're right. We, I always say we we take the cases everybody else doesn't want to take. Right? The, the conventional family party is like, I don't have time for that. And we're like, bring them on. I like the complexity. Patients will bring in these inches of chart work that they've had done. And I'm like, I love. They they always ask if I, I'm afraid that they brought too many medical records. I'm like, nope, <laughs> right? Because we like that data. Now, something that came to mind that I know you'll remember from medical school is Occam's razor, right? It was this idea that we have the single hypothesis hypothesis that unifies the diagnosis, the most concise explanation is the right one. Well, maybe just talk a little bit about, because we're talking about blowing that apart and saying, no, it's actually multi-layered, multi-complexity. Maybe in that framework, let's talk just a little bit about why that isn't the greatest model for this complex chronic disease that we see nowadays. And, and I think that's really important, which is the way medicine is taught in medical school and in residency is to try to oversimplify things and pigeonhole symptoms into the first diagnosis you can come up with rather than ask, to me, the overriding question, does that really explain this patient's illness? And that's where I find my colleagues are often leading patients down the wrong road because they're not, like if the real, I, I, I think of it as critical thinking skills. Yes. Let me put it this way, where if you really look at it, okay, my patient is complaining of this, 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 and this. The, the label that was given to him at some major medical center, that doesn't fit. That only explains 20% of their symptoms. Like, come on, if you really have a good diagnosis, it should explain everything. So, so that's where I think Modern medicine is failing most people with chronic illness. Yeah. And I just I have to laugh at these terms we throw out, like idiopathic. We don't really know what's going on, right? And then NOS, not otherwise specified. Well, this random thing that, so all these, we already, act, we actually have medical terms in the diagnostic criteria that explain this lack of curiosity, lack of really in depth. It's just like, oh, let's throw them in this garbage basket, right? Yeah. And, and I think that the majority of physicians 
want to do right by their patients. But the way the practice of medicine has evolved with HMOs, managed care, they don't have time. Yes. And they're under tremendous pressure to cram through as many patients as possible in the shortest time possible. And if you have someone with a chronic illness or any complexity at all, that's not going to cut it. It just can't. So I know that you and I have evolved practices where we spend a lot more time with each patient visit because it's necessary. There's no other way to do this. Yes. So let's talk about that because I feel like as a clinician, you are one of the heroes and founders of so many of these principles. And part of it is because your approach to the patient has really worked and also should be an example for a lot of us who are, you know, continue to try to go deep. Maybe talk a little bit about if a patient were to come to visit you or do a Zoom call, how would you approach this? Because I think that approach is where it starts with getting clarity. I think it starts with just listening, meaning having enough time in your schedule that a patient can tell their whole story. And I can't count, and I know you've had the same experience, the patients who've come to see me have just not felt heard or listened. Almost everyone that I work with, there are very few malingerers, there are very few people who are making it up. It's not in their head. They have a story to tell. And the answer to what's wrong with them is almost always in that story. If I can just be quiet enough, listen, step back. I think it's estimated that in the, in the average patient encounter, and this has been studied, patients have about 14 seconds before they're interrupted by their physician to move them along and get them going and, and not, I mean, 14 seconds, like you can barely give me your name right. in 14 seconds. So I think the key is listening. And I would say listening, not just to the words or the content, but how the patient tells their story, their body movements, their language, where they pause, where they reflect. They're constantly radiating information to me while we're talking together. And if I can just be receptive, then I can take that information and begin to get a feel for what is the primary issue that they're wrestling with. And I think that is, it has always been the basic tenet of medic medical practice, but we just don't do it anymore. Yeah. And then my, my second pet peeve is that I can't count the number of patients who've been to me, who've been to specialists, you name it. And when I would examine them and do an actual physical exam, they would say, you're the first person who's touched me ever. And you're going, what? That's basic medical practice. Says, no, no, no. My cardiologist never even listened to my heart. He's just looking at the echocardiogram and the CT and, and coming up with a diagnosis with that. It's like, so again, it, it's we're not doing what medicine was always evolved to do. Listen, touch, connect. And I think that's where we begin the process of helping figure out what's really wrong with them. I could not agree more. And I love how eloquently you you told that because it truly is like we know from birth, the infant's connection to the mother, the eye connection, the being seen, being held. We know that the infants that weren't held at all have way worse outcomes and probably more than food or drink or anything. It's this human connection that's the start of healing. So you just very well uh, spoke that. What about, we talked earlier and part of it was we talked about um the intuitive piece that we bring as clinicians. I think at least my experience in medical school is it had no value. It's all science and analytical mind. Tell us a little bit about why you believe and I believe as well, this is just not true. And maybe some of our most powerful insights come from that intuitive energetic sense. Well, um, as you know, I, I taught at the University of Minnesota at the medical school for 11 years. And I also trained family practice residents. I would watch how they would come to a conclusion about what was wrong with a patient, how they interacted. It's part of my job to teach them how to do that. And I would watch them make an intuitive leap throughout their interactions. 
But when I would ask them, well, how did you decide that? Nobody would own, oh, well, that was an intuitive leap. It was like, oh, well, no, that's not, that's, that would be unscientific. I wouldn't be a good person if I did that. So I, I watched people minimize their intuition and thereby lose a huge piece of what was going on. And when I was in medical school, I had an experience which I'll, I'll share with you. I was learning the art from EMT physicians of looking in an ear. Okay, it's pretty straightforward, right? You just put in a, a otoscope and you look inside and you see something. But I began to get the sense that we're all looking in these otoscopes, but we're not all seeing the same thing. It's the same experience we have when people sit at a beautiful scenic overlook and they've got a camera and they're all taking different pictures. They're not all seeing the same thing in the same way. And how that informed diagnosis would be, I would look in an ear and then I would ask my residents and attending physicians to draw what they saw, not tell me about it, draw it and they all drew different pictures wow and the the key to this was most of the reasons we're looking in an ear let's say it's a child and we're thinking about maybe they have otitis media which is very common and when you look in an ear of the otitis the eardrum is red or it's bulging or it's retracted but it has a certain appearance and i would watch two residents and an attending look in an ear and all draw something different and it occurred to me that what they were doing is that they were being affected by their intuition to draw what they thought the patient needed so that they could justify it by their drawing. So if a physician thought that this was simply a retracted ear and not infected, they would not put the patient on an antibiotic. But if they thought that that ear was red, they would put the patient on the antibiotic and feel justified by it. So. Even at that stage, I became kind of fascinated by human perception and how we shape it to do what we think is right. So I'm not saying that those physicians did anything wrong whatsoever, but they didn't own or understand their own process and how they worked. And I, and I think to me, that's a major topic in medicine that we should be talking about. Because how do we decide you have this, yes. you have that? Um, yes, we put our well-developed right brains into action by putting data and information and lab tests together. But especially with chronic patients, yes. they're so complicated. There's so much data. How do you tease it apart to come up with what should I do first? Yes. Not can I list the 23 things that are wrong with you, which in medicine we call differential diagnosis, but what do we, you and I as a patient, need to work on first because that's the priority, that's the starting point. And that's where I think if you don't use intuition, you have no way to figure this out because intuition can cut through that process in a way that merely listing all these things doesn't do. Oh, that is such a, a profound and important thought because you're right. And I really, there's the science would say there's these three, three things and it doesn't matter how you order them, but we, you and I know that it does. It makes me think of mold related illness, which we both deal with a lot of patients with mold related illness. And my thought on that is years ago when I had mold exposure myself and got very ill from mold, I can actually have a line in the sand where before that, I never thought about that in my differential because I didn't realize how many people were affected by it and how much affected autoimmunity, brain function, you name it, skin, histamine, mast cell. So that period prior to my own exposure, I would have probably missed a lot of diagnoses that at the root had mold. And then of course I go through it and my lens all of a sudden is shifted, right? Because then I see what it did to my body. I understand it at a deep, deep level. I understand what it took to heal. And, and then I understand the complexities of how weird it, it changes your mind and your perception and your uh, ex extroversion versus introversion in your limbic system. And we can talk about some of this, but all that to say that after that, I remember thinking, oh my gosh, this is crazy. There's so many people affected by mold. And I actually um, held myself back a little because I wanted to make sure that I wasn't seeing everything as mold because I knew I had a new lens, right? 
But what happened was I would actually hold back and oh, this can't be mold again. And guess what? At the root, it ended up. And so it shifted my perception. And as you and I know, it's probably one of the reasons why we are good mold related illness clinicians, because we have a lens that understands this crazy disease. Talk a little about that, because what you're saying is the lens that we bring as a clinician affects everything, right? Well, it is now estimated that there are 10 million Americans suffering from mold toxicity. And I would say a fraction know it because their physicians have never heard of it. One of my favorite comments from physicians is, well, if this was a real thing, I, they would have taught it to me in medical school. I'm thinking, gosh, I went to medical school 50 years ago. Now, this wasn't a known illness back then. If I'm stuck with what I learned in medical school as all I have tools I have to work with, there's nothing we've learned in the last 50 years, really. But for me, that's a, a non sequitur. It's a silly statement, but I get it a lot. I, I get the sense of somebody should have taught this to me if it's a real thing to look at. And, and there's also the phenomena of what I call water seeking its own level. I don't know how people find me. I mean, you and I are fairly well known now in our field, so people seek us because we're, we're known. But before we were known, people still sought us. And how? what was that energetic resonance that would um, get someone to hear about me from a friend and go, you know, I, I think that he might be the person who would help me. So we all attract the kinds of people who need us for some reason. And no one's studying that. And I think that's a really important thing to study. Wow. I, I could not agree more. And again, you're saying the things that are unspoken so eloquently. Let's talk about shift a little bit about your new book about the sensitive patient. And at the core of so many people you and I tend to attract is the sensitive patients. And I actually think you and I had a conversation about this before, that part of our view of the world, our curiosity, our love for this complexity is the fact that we like details. We like to see these things. So we probably are those same sensitive people, right? So talk a little bit about um, the sensitive patient and how we approach them, why it's different from the classical way that, that we might get success in medicine. So I think you're actually touching on two things. One is being an empath, yes, which of course we know you are, and I am to some degree, um, which allows a human being to actually feel what someone else is describing, not just hear it, not just resonate to it, but actually feel it. It's a very common human capacity, which again, people don't own the way they need to, because it allows us to connect to people on a very deep level without words being ex exchanged. It, it's the person who you are being empathic to can feel it also. And so medically, it's an extremely helpful thing to do as long as you don't get sucked up in that other person's feeling, which is yeah. also a liability to that process and very important. That's a piece of what you were saying. So, Again, I'll come back in time. 25 years ago, I'm not sure I was seeing patients as sensitive as I see them now. Over the past 25 years, do I think to the increasing toxicity of the world we live in, patients have been increasingly getting more and more sensitive. And by sensitive, I mean sensitive to all of the stimuli, light, sound, touch, smell, EMF, food, all of those things are, are true sensitivities. And unfortunately, those sensitive people have generally not been believed by the people in their life, their spouses, their family, uh, their friends, certainly not their physicians. So when someone would say, I'm becoming so light sensitive that I have to wear sunglasses indoors yeah. or I can barely be around certain sounds because it just grates on my nervous system, or I can't be around certain smells because I get sick immediately. The general response of most people in the medical community has been, eh, you're weird, you're a nutcase, this, it's in your head, 
nobody's that sensitive. And the truth is, yes, people are that sensitive. And there are now many, many, many more of them than we realized. Um, you know, a recent study in, in England uh, were reported on by, by Claudia Miller was that 1% of the English population was so sensitive that they were disabled, legally disabled. And up to 35% of the English population was sensitive enough that affected their life. So we're not talking about something super rare or unheard of. It's way more common, but no one really wants to talk about it. Hmm, we've already had that conversation. So I've sort of become the Lorax. I speak for the trees in Dr. Seuss talk yes. um, of realizing that nobody was making up what they were telling me when they described this kind of sensitivity as real. I didn't know what to do with it 25 years ago. I didn't have any grasp of what was physiologically happening to them, their biochemistry. I knew that I didn't know how to help them, which was very frustrating, but I didn't doubt what they were feeling. So over the last 25 years, um, and this is the whole purpose of my new book, we have learned a great deal about what sensitivity means neurologically and biochemically inside the body, meaning we now know what it's doing, what, what is happening to us that's creating the sensitivity. And by knowing that, now we know how to treat it. So um, the beauty of it, and the reason I wrote this book is I really wanted all those sensitive folks out there to understand it's not in my head. This is totally real. This is a neurological biochemical shift in me. And we know what is triggering it or causing it. So great. Now we know how to treat it. And, and so it's a whole new field that, and, and, I, and I know you work with these patients just the way, the way I do. Yeah. And I want to dive into that and talk about like, how do we approach it as clinicians and how do the patients deal with these sensitivities? So some real practical things. Um, and I wonder if you might also just uh, kind of define, you did a really good job at some of the common things, but I recently posted a, a, a little post on a highly sensitive person, which Elaine Aaron wrote about emotionally sensitive people and is light and sound and stuff. But what I found is that overlaps into those who are chemically sensitive and sensitive to drugs. And so, so it's kind of a whole spectrum, emotionally, physically, spiritually, energetically, you name it, right? Um, would right. you say that's true is, is when someone's extra sensitive, they're usually extra sensitive in multiple layers and areas, and they might also be more prone to environmental toxicity. Is that true? Yes, on all of all counts. Once you understand what the nervous system is doing, it begins to make sense because what controls the sensitivity is the limbic system of our brain. And depending on your personal um, innate biochemistry and genetics, um, we could all be exposed to a particular stimulus and respond in different ways. Once the limbic system begins to be dysfunctional, it starts with one thing and then it spreads so that you might start with being a little bit chemically sensitive and then you become sensitive to light and then you become more sensitive to EMF and those get worse as time goes on. If you don't figure out what's triggering that sensitivity in the first place, it will get worse because the limbic system's job is to protect you by scrutinizing the stimuli that you're being exposed to for safety. It's all about safety, not trying to make you sick, but it's trying to go, is that sound safe for me? Is that smell safe for me? And if it doesn't think you're safe, it's going to shut you down by giving you symptoms, yeah. not to make you miserable, but to warn you, oh, there's something out there that you really need to get away from in order for you to be healthy and safe. And then, again, that just gets worse with time. So that's the start of it. To complete this, the beginning of that subject, another part of the brain, which we call the vagal nerve system, does the same thing differently. So the vagus nerve controls intestinal motility and has branches that goes to the heart and the lungs. It controls what we call our autonomic nervous system, our breathing, our pulse, um, our ability to regulate temperature. So 
that system is also looking at those stimuli. And the two systems talk to each other constantly. They're different parts of the brain, but they're talking to each other regularly about, is that safe? Is that safe? Do you think that's safe? And they shut us down. So what we've learned, and this is the wonderful part of it, I want listeners to know this. Everything I'm talking about is treatable. We now understand it. So we have methods for quieting the limbic system, methods for bringing the vagus nerve back online properly. Um, and the trifecta in this, what makes us sensitive is the mast cell activation process. That's not neurological, it's cellular. Mast cells are a, if you will, in the family of white blood cells. They're a bridge between the immune system and the nervous system, a direct bridge. So we have these three systems which are constantly talking to each other. And when one system tends to get out of whack, the others will come along as well. So in a sensitive patient, I call it the trifecta of sensitivity. We have limbic, vagal, and mast cell issues, all of which are treatable. So that's the start of it. Uh, that makes so much sense. And I know a lot of our listeners are going, yeah, that's me. Tell us more, um, Dr. Nathan. This is a great framework because you and I both have been out there talking to other doctors and saying, we have to start with the limbic system and the vagal system because at these patients, maybe you can tell us why, if you just throw a drug or even supplements in the beginning, if you don't go to the beginning uh, points of this, you're not going to get a great response. Tell us a little bit about order of operations and why understanding this is a key to getting them um, the start of healing. If a body doesn't feel safe, it can't accept or respond to supplements or medications, even if it needs them, because it's on survival mode. It's basically going, yep, thanks for that, but what am I going to do with that? I'm on survival mode. I can't do anything until I feel safer. So now not everyone that we treat is in this state, of course. So some of our patients with mold toxicity can easily take the binders, anti-inflammatories, um, anti-fungal um, materials that they need to get well, and that's great. But you and I are often seeing the patients who have become sensitive, and those materials given by other physicians um, at normal doses have thrown those patients under the bus. Didn't mean to. They just can't do it. So for most of our patients, for me, the order is limbic and vagal first as a, as a duality. You have to work on them together. If the limbic and vagal systems are both hypervigilant and you quiet the limbic system and you don't work on the vagal system, not going anywhere, vice versa. So you have to work on the limbic and vagal systems together, then mast cell activation. Again, it depends on the patient. If a patient can take the supplements for mast cell activation from the get-go, fabulous. But our most sensitive patients often can't. They'll take, again, normal doses of the materials we use for mast cell activation, and under the bus they go. So my order is limbic vagal, when they're ready, mast cell, when they're ready. Then we treat mold or Lyme or Bartonella or whatever we think the primary issue is that's triggering all of this. Yes, I, I could not agree more. So let's go to limbic and vagal. I agree with you there. What are some practical ways that someone maybe at home or without even a physician involved at this point could start to work on these things? And I'm sure it's all in your book. So I want to be sure and call out to get the book so you have a guide. But um, in addition to the book, where else can they start? Well, and by the way, in my book, I have 20 guest authors, and they're all top in the field in that subject. So, for example, on the limbic system, chapters are written by Annie Hopper and Esha Gupta. Mm -hmm. On the vagal nerve, I wrote the chapter with Steve Porges. These are all the, the major people in the field doing this work. So I, I didn't want this book to be my book. I wanted it to be our book um, of a whole bunch of experts, people who really work all telling you, yes, what you have is valid and we know how to, how to fix it. So to answer your question, um, th there are three main systems I like to work for the limbic system. Annie Hopper's Dynamic Neural Retraining Program, 
Ashok Gupta's amygdala retraining program. And a newer one that I like a lot is Primal Trust by Kathleen King. Couldn't agree um, more. <laughs> All three. Yeah. Those are my favorites. There are others out there. As people have recognized how important limbic retraining is, more and more people are getting on the bandwagon. But Annie and Ashok have been in the field the longest. And you can go online, um, Google their names and their program, and you can get their program and work with it. And they're, they're excellent. I've had over a thousand people do Annie's program, a thousand people do Gupta's program. And increasingly, uh, my patients are liking uh, the Primal Trust program as well. So in that category, that's where you want to start. In the vagal word, I'll give you what I call a smorgasbord of vagal treatments because there's a, there's a bunch. Um, one of the things I like a lot are some new devices that are called vagal nerve stimulators. Um, there's a bunch on the market. Again, I, I list them in my book, but um, the main thing I want to tell you all about vagal nerve stimulators is do not use them the way the instructions from the company come. For example, one of my favorites is called Apollo Neuro. It's a band that you can wear on your wrist and you can set it at varying levels. The company says, start by wearing this for five to eight hours a day. Please don't do that if you're a sensitive patient. You, your, your body will not thank you. You can overstimulate a vagus nerve as well as reboot it. So I tell my sensitive patients to start with wear it for three minutes once a day, then slowly increase to five minutes, 10 minutes once a day, 10 minutes twice a day. If you can do more comfortably, fine, but do not start the way any of the devices tell you to start. Start low, work up from it. I love osteopathic cranial work as a method for treating the, the vagus and the autonomic nervous system. I love frequency-specific microcurrent as a method for, for treating this. There's a device that I like a lot, um, Brain Tap by Patrick Porter, but it uses light and sound to reboot those systems. And for those people who are light or sound sensitive, that will set you back. So for those folks, if that's the issue, that wouldn't be the first thing that I would do. So there's more, but those would be my favorite vagal strategies. And my advice to, to patients is, you must do limbic and vagal work concurrently. The more of these things you can do, the more effectively and quickly you will begin the process of feeling safer, and then you will be able to respond better to all the treatments that you need to do to actually get well. Yes. Um, boy, amen. A really, really great list there because it's very practical. I've bought a couple of vagal nerve stimulators. Now, one thing on some of these will attach to your earlobe, the trigus, which is a, a common pathway for the vagal nerve. I think the the problem is some of those can actually burn your skin. It's a little device that like I found if I wear it too much, I actually get an irritated sore there, which is not healthy. So the limit, the amounts. And, and then the other thing I thought was very interesting. I did a retreat in Mexico not too long ago, and I was in kind of a low adrenal, very, very low sympathetic tone state probably. And they did some testing. Um, I'm not sure what the machine was. It was from Germany that showed my sympathetic, parasympathetic tone. And I was actually in the realm of like master meditator, which was not, you know, but it was because my parasympathetic was so high and my sympathetic was so low. And I literally that week when I was so relaxed and so low tone, I was like, I feel like I'm going to die if I don't move. And that's also a kind of, <laughs> right. You can, you can get what I literally was so still that I was like, I'm going to die. And I obviously wasn't like in a depressed state or anything. It was just my limbic system. And that was actually so low on the other end that I needed to move um, to activate um, that just brings up a thought because sometimes I tell people to walk because that motion is so healing. Any sense of those who might be stuck in a free state um, and and like how they could do some things to get out of that free state? Well, it's all about balance. But I suspect if I'm going to go out on a limb uh -huh. that you've been running on a sympathetic drive for so long yep. that, when you went in, that when you went into the parasympathetic state, your body went, what is this? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, what is this? <laughs> exactly. How am I supposed to deal with this? So it's it's it can be a shock to the body if you 
jump shift or quantum leap from being in a hypersympathetic state to a hyperparasympathetic state. It yeah. can be, I, I'm guessing that that might have played a role for you. It was interesting though, because I'm using all these vagal nerve stimulators. And at that moment, I'm like, I think I need to walk, like move, <laughs> right? To get that. So yeah. I love that you said that because we're back to our personalized and intuitive medicine. Like I intuitively knew what my body needed and I got out of it. And it was no big deal. It's just, I never in a million years thought that I would be like registering such a high parasympathetic tone. But again, I was in a different state, relaxed. Um, and I think all of us have the ability to access these. If we just learn, like probably I'm sure what you do is teach patients to really trust their own intuition. Maybe talk about that a little bit, because I think it's underrated in empowering the patient to really trust what their signals in their body are telling them, right? We're all taught from an early age that there are experts who know more about us than we do. Our parents, our religious leaders, our teachers, and we're, we're vulnerable when we're little to their information, whatever it is they tell us, which is you have no artistic ability, you have no musical voice, please don't sing in public, whatever, whatever you're taught. And we're little and we can't really objectively look at that information. And so we, we're filled with other people's, I call them other people's programs, other people's ideas of who we are that may have nothing to do with who we are now as a human being. And so we literally have to rewrite those programs when we get older. We have to really look at what were we taught? Is that true? And maybe it was well-intentioned as a statement to us, but it's simply not true. So we literally, our job as we get to be adults is to rediscover who we are and own it because that's what we're supposed to be doing here on this planet is to be the best version of ourselves. Yes. And again, going back to medical school, at least for me as an empath, I was trained to live from the neck up and everything was brain derived analytical assessment of the situation. And as I've grown in my own healing and then in healing with patients, I learned to go down and actually feel because the sensations in our bodies clue us into what's happening. And I think a lot of women and men get disconnected from that. And as a sensitive patient, part of the healing is really reconnecting. What is healing? What feels good to me? What do I need to do next? Um, and and actually us as clinicians, encouraging the patient to trust that because sadly, what's happened to a lot of um, patients, they go into their doctor like, doc, I don't feel well, something's wrong. They don't really know what's wrong, but the doc looks at the labs and says, well, everything looks fine. So then just like you said, we outsource our trust to that expert and we think, well, something, I must be fine because he says I'm fine or she says I'm fine. So I love that you're encouraging that reconnecting to our body systems because our body gives us all the information we need if we just listen. Yeah, I, I got through medical school primarily because of three things I did that most of my colleagues did not. Um, and what I saw when I started medical school, um, I went to the University of Chicago and I, and I know you were in Chicago as yeah. well. I was, that was a maybe a connection we have there. I went to the University of Chicago and I mean, it's filled with really bright people. And I saw when I started, really intelligent, bright, creative people become increasingly shut down as human beings. So by the time they graduated, they were a shadow of who they had been when they started medical school. And I just couldn't let that happen. My spirit wouldn't allow it. I don't know if it's intelligence or intuition, but my spirit was dying doing that. Yeah. And so um, my, my, one of my loves in life has been playing basketball. And so I was on every intramural team that I could be at the University of Chicago. I loved theater. So I acted in every play possible. And wow. I loved art. So I used to go to the Art Institute, which in those days was open in the evenings until nine o'clock. And if you went in the evening, you could have some of the museum to yourself. And I remember just sitting for hours in the Monet room, just looking at that incredible artwork and just taking it in. So that's how I got through medical school. I just wouldn't let my spirit not be me. I, I couldn't be taken over by the becoming an automaton like happened to so many of my colleagues. So 
for whatever reason, I, I didn't let medical school kick that out of me. And I think the world might regret that, but there we oh, are. Oh no, I love it. And I love, love, love what you bring to medicine and to the world and to myself and all of our colleagues. It's so, so important that, that kind of unique perspective, because I think we do need to keep that. It's like right brain, left brain, science, faith, all these kind of like pieces of ourselves. And they really actually, we separate them and we draw these things that are really not true. And it's all connected. <laughs> it's all, it's right. all. I mean, so I would not study before exams. I would play basketball so that I would come into my exams relaxed. Yes. And in a relaxed state, you can access information incredibly better than it was like yes. uh, being uptight. Like, what was that thought? What was that fact? What page was that on? What, uh, it's, you just come into it and I'm more, okay, I trust my memory. I've studied hard. I'm going to trust my memory to spit back whatever information you all want. So I can I the way we are taught the way education is done, I mean, I'll take this back a step. The world that little children are being born into right now is so stressful that everyone should be taught to meditate in, in school at the earliest of ages so that we can begin the process of quieting our limbic and vagal systems down at an early age, not to the point that by the time we're a teenager, we're frazzled already. Yeah. I mean, are we getting into the right college? Did I do all the right things? I'm like, uh, as opposed to, no, I worked hard and I studied and I'll, I'll get. So I, I, I think there's something really wrong with the way we were preparing children to enter the world that we're creating for them. Oh, I couldn't agree more. And even like eight hours in a chair is not the right thing for it. Uh, young men or women. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh goodness. Um, well, in our last few minutes, first of all, we, if you are listening and want the guide, the sensitive patients healing guide by Dr. Neil Nathan will be coming out or will be out actually when this podcast is live. So you can get your own copy and I highly recommend it. Cause I think you're going to want to read and reread. And the nice thing is Dr. Nathan is we're empowering people because it's great if they can see you or I, or another colleague of ours, but many of these people either won't have the resources or the location or place where they can see someone like us. And the great thing is they can do a lot on their own with your resource of the book. Um, for that person who's sitting there listening and who has been told by the docs they're crazy and they have symptoms and they incredibly sensitive to this world and they're feeling kind of hopeless, what would you say to that person? Find someone who understands what you're saying. Then don't take no for an answer. Uh, you may have to, but you probably need to look in the right place for it. In uh, functional or integrative medicine, it's unlikely that someone in conventional medicine will have those answers. It's much more likely that someone who's been studying integrative medicine for a while will be knowledgeable enough that they will understand what you're saying. Most physicians in that field don't work in an HMO and they don't limit your visit to seven minutes before we're done with you. So you're more likely to be heard. But again, if whoever is talking to you, I don't care what their credentials are, could be me. If you don't feel heard, leave, leave that area. Don't take it to heart that it's you, find someone who can listen to you, can understand you, and then can begin the process of leading you back on the road to recovery. Brilliantly said and so true. So there is always hope. Um, what's the next steps for Dr. Neil Nathan? Are you working on anything else or what are we, anything to expect in the next year or two from you besides this new book? Well, you're not going to be surprised at the answer. Um, I'm currently, my publisher has asked me to put out an updated second edition for Toxic, and I'm working on that right now. And I have started a new book, um, which basically is about how inflammation is the center role of almost all chronic ill, and how to understand inflammation at a deeper level and know how to work with it. So I've written the first few chapters of that. I'm writing it with um, a, another uh, person that is even more knowledgeable about the immune system than I am. Um, so I've got those things cooking. Um, I do 
consult with physicians about their most difficult patients that's available. And I do have a mentorship program that I do with Jill Krista um, on these chronic inflammatory conditions. Uh, we have almost 200 physicians in our mentorship group. And um, for any physicians out there listening to this or anyone with prescriptive authority, um, um, naturopaths, PAs, nurse practitioners, you're very welcome to join our group. And if you want to learn how to do this in more detail and better, and we, Jill and I just want to um, impart what we know to those of you who want to hear it. Two of my favorite people in the world are you and Jill Krista, so I, I couldn't endorse that more. Where can people find you, Dr. Nathan? Um, I live on the south coast of Oregon. I, don't, I know you didn't mean it that way, but, I'm, <laughs> but, but that's my sense of humor. Yeah. Um, my website is very simple, neilnathanmd.com. And you can get access to the mentorship program, my books, lectures, workshops. I, I teach a great deal. And I appreciate very much, Jill, the opportunity to hang out with you for a while and share what we've learned with your audience. Thank you. Thank you, as always, for the wealth of knowledge and heart and compassion and sensitivity that you bring to the world of medicine. You are so appreciated.